Hello, everybody. Tara Bachlin here with the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism. We're getting ready tonight uh, for actually for our fruit, food allergies and food sensitivities, the herbs that you can use for food allergies and food sensitivities. Class is going on tonight with Matthew Wood and Francis Bonaldo. But while we have Matt and Francis with us, I thought we'd have them tell us about their upcoming class regarding Culpepper. And I'm just going to show you real quick uh, uh, what that page looks like on the Institute. So uh, as always, you can find new classes and courses. This is our homepage and you can find new classes and courses under new live online classes. And this class is coming up later this month. It's actually, there are two classes, Practical Herbalism from the Renaissance, A Voyage with Culpepper. And this is with Matthew Wood and Francis Bonaldo. Francis has taught the pulse assessment course with Matthew Wood and um, a longtime student as well. But you may have heard Culpepper. You're like, Culpepper, I've I know that name, maybe you very well know the name, but if you're like me, I'm like, I've heard the name many, many times, but I wasn't quite sure who he is. And so Nicholas Culpepper was a 17th century rebel herbalist who dared to write a complete herbal in plain English to empower the common people. And so he was really quite a man of our times, right? Someone who is um, yeah. um, really... Uh, speaking is a great time for him to be speaking to us from through Matthew and Francis. So you can read more about the class here. It's actually going to be two two hour classes, and um, I'll tell you more about it in a few minutes. But I'd actually it's it's going to be more fun for you to hear straight from Matthew and Francis themselves. Matt's going to tell us a little bit about Culpepper. Um, Francis is going to tell us a few factoids and um, tell us a little bit about um, Francis who he is, where he's from, and why is Francis teaching this class? Um, and I'll tell you the, the goodies that are included in a little bit. So thanks for, um, thanks for the tour, Matt and Francis. Okay. Well, Francis is, uh, has been a student of mine and Lisa's. Um, he went to acupuncture school in um, Minnesota there, and he didn't waste his extra time. He studied with the two of us and particularly with Lise. So he's very, very well versed in the types of things that she and I know. And then he's gone on and expanded on that on his own. And one area where he's expanded has been Culpepper. I believe also you've read ancient Chinese books um, that are kind of a little bit out of the norm. And then you found this and he speaks French. He's from Quebec, uh, but he's also of French descent too. And um and um, he, well, I guess that's true of a lot of people in Quebec, <laughs> but, but he found uh, French um, information on pulse diagnosis too, which is really fascinating. And we're going to have him do an update on pulse diagnosis, including that information at some point in the future too. So stay tuned. And then um, he's done really a lot of original work on Culpepper and just, immersed himself in Culpepper. Well, so why is Culpepper important? Why uh, would he do that? Why do, I mean, to my mind, every single English language herbalist uh, from Australia, from the Antipodes to um, Canada, to the US should, to Britain, should know Culpepper's name and uh, should really understand how important he was. And uh, just to give you a hint, the only book in English other than the Bible that has never been out of print since 1652 is Nicholas Culpepper's Complete Herbal. It's just been that popular. That's pretty extraordinary. So despite all the, uh, you know, laws against um, uh, alternative medicine, which aren't as bad in the British Commonwealth countries as they are in the United States, um, uh, he has persisted. So he was born in, is it 1619, I think, um, Francis? In, uh, 16, I think. Yeah. Well, 1616. Ah, yeah, you're right. And he died in, he, as Francis is saying, Francis is now the age that Nicholas Culpepper was right. when he died. He was 38. 38. So I think around the 54. Yeah. 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 Five. Yes, and that was not because he was bad at herbal medicine, but because 
He was active. He was a rebel. He fought against the king. He was uh, shot and wounded at Naseby, the Battle of Naseby, which is where the king was overthrown in 1642, and the king was executed in 1644. I don't doubt that if Culpepper had survived until the king was reinstated, the son of the king, that he would have been, <laughs> he would have probably had to flee to France or somewhere <laughs> or the United States. That would have been kind of fun. I mean, uh, the colonies. But um, he, because he was an extreme radical, really. And he, there's a lot of um, rantings against Catholics, for instance, and uh, Papists, as he would say, and the medical fraternity, um, Dr. Tradition, and so on, that he writes about in his very fun. Unusual. He's a great writer, too. Another reason he's in print. So he uh, he was from he was kind of a second son of, a, you know, the Lord level. Actually, his father was more like so his father was a clergyman. He had a so he was supposed to go to he did go to um, Cambridge and learned Greek and Latin. And then he dropped out. I mean, this is almost unheard of for, you know, the son of uh, one of these um important yeah. families like this. To, he dropped out and he finally managed to get his mother to invest the last of his inheritance in becoming an apprentice to an apothecary, which is like going from being a semi the uh, poor cousin of the Lords to being a, you know, master carpenter or something. It's like just not, it's really a fall in um, rank. And, but it turned out the apothecaries did not know Greek or Latin. And yet the, um, English pharmacopoeia, the London pharmacopoeia was written in Latin. So he was the only one who actually knew how to read it. And there were about 25 doctors in, in uh, London and they uh, kept a monopoly on everything. And he translated that. And the King by this point had been executed and London was kind of under the control of uh, the rabble and uh, eventually uh, Cromwell. And um, so all the copyright laws were all, and anyways, all the copyrights belonged to royalists. So he was able to publish the London Pharmacopoeia without the permission of the physicians. And this was a breakthrough. I mean, this was just everybody could read the Pharmacopoeia now. And that was 1652 when his, his herbal came out in 16, 1653 or four. And um, so uh, just before he died. And so he really wanted to bring the herbalism to the common people. And uh, this created a huge split where medicine became, it's like, we don't want the herbs. We want to be more and more scientific and refined and use chemicals and everything and let the common people use the herbs. And so that was the beginning of the split. So he empowered the common people with herbalism, but he also helped contribute to that split. We can't blame him because it was really not his fault. It was their fault. Although he egged them on, I would say, um, so he was uh, incredibly popular as a practitioner in his time. Uh, and some of the, a few of the accounts of the herbs, you really see that like marshmallow root, you really under, know that he understood that herb in depth. Another thing about him was he was an astrologer and he did do astrological herbalism. And I do have to say he kind of belittled the Galenic. He, I, not really belittled it, but he, uh, did not give it a lot of press. So he kind of switched. Uh, so since he was so dominating in the British Anglo-American, Anglo uh, worldwide um, diaspora um, of uh, herbalism, he, he kind of changed the, the way people thought about herbs to these astrological categories from the Galenic hot, cold, damp, dry which he doesn't get into with as much excitement. Okay. So that was uh, one thing that I would hold against him. I'm going to do a class at some point on, on uh, Culpepper's uh, book called uh, A Key to, Ga of, to Galen's Art of Physic by, uh, by Culpepper, where he sums that system up. But at any rate, uh, you'll hear more about his fascinating and unbelievable almost history. Sometimes I call him the first hippie. He just was such a complete rebel. And I've only told some of the information. And, uh, and that time period was like extraordinary. It's personally significant to me, just this last note, because my father's family were Quakers and they became Quakers in that period when the king had been deposed and there was like 20 years of chaos. Uh, and um, they and the, so it's kind of stamped on my family history. And uh, 
of significance to me. But you'll hear more about that those times uh, later. Now let's hear from Francis, who's really looked in depth and used many of of Culpepper's indications. I have to say, I've learned things from him. Plus, he's added he'll he'll add the pulse for sage or something like that, and uh, it fits perfectly with what Culpepper talks about. So, Francis, take it away. <laughs> hey, thanks, Matthew. Um, yeah, so as Matthew said, uh, Culpepper was a pretty incredible guy for his time, I would say. And uh, I, uh, before I did herbalism, I was into uh, just literature, so I just like to read. So, uh, of course, I studied with Matthew and Lise, but I need to read in life. So uh, I'm kind of a nerd, always looking for old books. And, uh, well, Lise and Matthew did mention Culpepper here and there while teaching herbs. So I said, uh, I'm going to look up this guy. And I really fell in love with uh, his writing. Uh, I found like it spoke to me almost uh, in a almost in a loud voice. So I uh, I started reading Culpepper just from beginning to end, just all the time at the bus stop uh, anywhere, and uh, I really got interested in it because uh, it's a it's a pre modern book. So there was no molecules back then. So it's a way of using herbs that has a completely different. Uh, brain, if you will, than we do today, even though we study energetics and we call ourselves tra traditional herbalists and so on, where we live in a world where everything is about molecules and it's hard to switch your brain from seeing uh, clients and thinking about, oh, this herb is, well, this herb is hot in energetics, but it's also antiviral. So let me use this herb for this guy with a cold or something. But the Culpepper, uh, it really takes you back to how humans viewed plants before modern science. And uh, that's actually very valuable because there's, uh, there's surprising things we might learn. Uh, you might think about plants in a different way that will uh, surprise you anyways. So uh, I, uh, the more I read Culpepper, the more I saw that when I was sometimes seeing clients or even friends, uh, I would... Uh, like the words would speak to me when I was treating people. Just a funny example. Uh, I think a friend was sleeping over one night and uh, he had like food poisoning or something. And it was the middle of the night and he woke me up and he was quite sick. And I just, I was, you know, out of it. And we had probably had a few drinks and something, but <laughs> I had that Culpepper sentence about lemon balm where it says uh, the syrup should be kept in every I think housewife's home to take care of their poor neighbor's sickly stomach. I mean, that, that just snapped to me, to my mind when I saw a friend like half dying and I gave lemon balm that was lying around and it immediately stopped the, I guess it was food poisoning or gastro. It immediately stopped the nausea. And it's like, he went back to say he was cured. And, and the, so to me, that was like the power of Culpepper is this uh, flowery language that he writes in. I found can really stick in your imagination and it kind of, uh, it became kind of almost a living tradition to me, not just a, a dead inanimate book. I, I kind of felt like reading it over and over, it made it come alive in my mind. So it became like a, it's like Culpepper is there with me when I'm treating people. And uh, I've never stopped uh, studying. It's so rich. Uh, I'm still, I would say, just scratched the surface of what's in one of his books, uh, The Complete Herbal and English Physician, which is a big book. But uh, it's so rich in uh, clinical, practical uses of plants that it's, it's incredible that we don't, uh, there should be like PhDs and whole schools dedicated to the study of <laughs> right. material. And uh, for people who like to claim kind of a, Western heritage and herbalism, well, this is like incredible. It's, it's like a gold mine. So uh, well worth the study. And uh, well, should I say, uh, there's a lot of old terms in Culpepper, like the apoplexy, which is about having a stroke. But the apoplexy suggests someone who's always uh, angry. So it kind of, it's like, a, it's a lot of images. So it's also when you see clients, you kind of see the image um, because it's not about molecules. So it's all images and all the herbalists and doctors treated the images 
and they saw images in nature and plants. And they, when clients came in and had illnesses, it was kind of like an image. The person's bent over with colic or intestinal spasms. Well, that was called the iliac passion. The iliac is like the hip bone. Oh, wow. And uh, intestinal inflammation sure does cause pain around the hip bone most of the time. I, I see that and I, I tell clients, they say like, oh, I've got, uh, I was at the hospital, my bowels are completely obstructed and it all sounds really bad. And I'm like, no, no, it's the iliac passion. That sounds better. And we can take care of that. We've got 17th century remedies for that. And it's all almost poetic and it makes, uh, it makes the medicine kind of more beautiful and imageful as opposed to dreadful and yeah. Yeah. So passion uh, also uh, the way, the reason I want to teach this course is because some of the words mean different things than they do today. So passion back in the day means suffering like the passion of the Christ is the suffering mm -hmm. before he was basically uh, impaled and killed. So the passion of the iliac is the suffering of the hip bone or the passion of the heart is the suffering of the heart. Um, so uh, the course will be very much about kind of the language. We'll take some quotes, different quotes that we'll all mostly pick. And uh, we'll kind of uh, look at different herbs and different sentences and quotes that kind of maybe can stick in, your, in our imagination. So, uh, and we owe it to Culpepper because uh, he only lived to 38 years old and he wrote many books. Uh, he had many kids, most of whom died, except one <laughs> out of like eight, seven, or some a ridiculous number of his kids died. Yeah. So, uh, he got shot in the chest, and I think he smoked a lot, so it probably didn't help with the healing. <laughs> well, they thought that smoking was good for um, tuberculosis and chronic <laughs> diseases. And actually, you know, during the COVID thing, it turned out that smokers actually right. did better than non-smokers. Yeah, so... so uh, <laughs> So, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> crazy. So uh, yeah. he really, I think he really, I think he must have worked himself to death in a way to, to like put out his work. Yeah. yeah. We, we owe, it, owe it to him to, to continue on his work. And he really meant it to be for the people. So we as the common people owe it to him to keep this knowledge alive. So... Um, yeah, he, he also wrote the first book uh, in English, in common language on uh, midwifery and was very important there. Yeah. And the next important book by Jane Sharp is the first book on midwifery by a woman that's written about 30 years later. And I remember reading in there, he says his wife, every time she got pregnant, it, they had 10 stillbirths and two live births. Yeah. And um Every time she got pregnant, her kidneys would get hot, he said. So she had a kidney infection, and he wasn't able to ferret that out. But, but it's interesting seeing some of these case histories and, and things. And there's, um, oh, there's a good book uh, by Gray and Tobin. Uh, those of you who can find that, um, the old first edition is usually pretty cheap. Yes. And then there's a second edition, and the difference is mostly in the introduction. And uh, it's a pretty good book there and a lot of good pictures. And so it's fun. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the terms for uh, women conditions back then uh, are not so popular today. Yeah. But Culpepper seemed to really take care of women. He had lots and lots and lots of remedies to help women with all kinds of issues, as I'll try to teach in the class. And also, yeah. um, he helped elders a lot. A lot of the remedies are really good for the brain, the aging brain, and the, oh. the, the digestion of ancient people. So, uh -huh. uh, you know, he, he seemed like he really took care of people, women, old people. So, um, you know, that's really, uh, we saw with COVID that women suffered more than anyone else, and old people were left behind. So, salt pepper medicine is... It's about, uh, it's about that, too. So. Yeah. Also, he records a lot of folk medicine. I began to realize this as I would sometimes read through the book. I haven't read it nearly as extensively as Francis, but I'd be kind of fascinated. And like, so one remedy that's, um, well, it's in the herb shops only because mostly because we have a Russian clientele. Um, that's we call it rabbit tobacco in America. That's uh, Helichrysum Immortal. Mostly Russians and Ukrainians really like that. 
and um, and the Cherokee and the Southerners um, USA use um, rabbit tobacco. But he talks about it. I think he calls it cudweed, <laughs> and he says the the people in Kent use it for head colds, basically. And so, and I asked a. Uh, one of my herbal cohorts that was in my master's program in England and Scotland in 2002, three and there who came from Kent and had an herb store there. I said, do people use this herb, still use this herb for, for uh, head colds? And she says, yeah, people come in all the time. They're in Kent for that remedy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So still alive. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And he recorded it. Cool. So, well, um, I hope people will join us because it should be, a, we have a, it's, there's so much material. We're doing two classes and yeah. I guess it'll be enough. We'll probably get off talking about cases, trees and herbs. And uh, yeah. I made a kind of a, how Matthew has written a huge repertory for uh, just general herbalism. I've made sort of a Culpeper repertory, like digging out categories of illnesses and sort of major remedies and it's kind of a research tool for people to use uh, to kind of research further what they were doing at the time. Sometimes there's weird remedies with chickpeas or something. So we, or beet juice to really clear up chronic sinus problems. I mean, who wants to try that out? Snuff up beet juice up your nose. I mean, we, nobody needs to do that. Because that <laughs> he said that was like one of the best remedies ever for, <laughs> wow. for the nose. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff in there uh, that's really worth uh, researching. And uh, we see in the news every now and then, like the, in England too, they find an old recipe from the 14th century that might be an herbal antibiotic for nowadays. Well, Culpepper has hundreds of remedies that might be used today. Like I literally mean hundreds. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we should be all over it. Maybe we'll have to do 10 classes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So uh, that's about uh, what we'll say for now, I think. Well, I do want to say that your repertory that you made is it's not a little short thing. It's like it, the one you sent me was at least 15 pages. It must be 20 by now or longer. Or, yeah, but... the, it's a medium size. It's a big repertory. And unfortunately, it doesn't include a lot of plants that are maybe perhaps more local to uh, England, to the shires of London. Yeah, an area, and I just uh, plants I really don't have access to, and uh, maybe some of our friends will have to do some of that work. But I have read most of the plant entries about those herbs, and there's all kinds of powerful, interesting remedies in there too. Um, so uh, the repertory is a work in progress that maybe uh, everyone can contribute to. Yeah, and it's quite. Uh, I mean, it's not a small document, so people should realize there's a lot of practical information in these two uh, classes. Uh, and I have not used all of it. I have used a lot of it. Yeah, I'm kind of, I use it as research myself. I have it in my office when I'm seeing clients. Sometimes I'll literally say, uh, hold on a minute, sir. I need to check this 17th century uh, thing here because <laughs> yeah. uh, your illness is really baffling me, so. And I will say uh, maybe one last thing. Uh, Matthew and Lise teach a really great style of herbal medicine, sort of based on specific medicine, knowing the constitution, the pulse, the tongue, the skin, and the very specific symptoms. So uh, already we have such a great system at the Institute. Uh, Culpepper's medicine is a bit more folksy. It's about like using a plant and drinking a tea of it and then using the leaves to put all over the liver area. It's kind of a bit more, I would say it's fairly specific. Uh, it's not just doing whatever, but uh, he has uh, fairly specific symptoms for most plants, but it's a bit more of something you can fall back on when you just don't have that great specific remedy. Mm. Uh, Culpepper kind of comes in second place there, and it really can give you a lot of other ideas to, to treat something or help somebody. Um, yeah, so... So worth knowing. Yeah. I just get more and more curious and excited for this class. I mean, it, it's kind of like you're uh, unveiling a mystery, you know? And um, so it just sounds super fascinating. Well, it's a uh, serious medicine too. Uh, 
people then go see somebody back in the day if they just had like a little anxiety or a little insomnia they had like a crazy ulcer coming out of their chest or they had the bloody diarrhea i mean it, this is serious medicine so yeah there's a lot of good information in there well there's reason there's a reason it survived centuries yeah right <laughs> yeah yeah. Well, I'm going to show people how they can join us for this amazing class. And uh, like Francis said, it's it's a two two class, two hour sessions each, and uh, learning about Culpeper, but especially the medical terminology. I don't know if you've well, even in Matt's books, you'll re, Matt will refer to the old time language, and um, and it's helpful that he uh, summarizes you know what that means kind of as you're reading, um, but. Um, we'll be getting into the language and having it come alive in our imagination. Like, like Francis said, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a flowery language. And what's, I like Francis's sense of humor when he was writing this, that he said, it, it takes a French speaking person, uh, a <laughs> French Canadian to explain to us in plain English, what these old time words mean. And um, it's true as a, a lover of language myself. Um, it's, it's amazing when, the insight you can get from another language for your own language is it's really quite amazing. This, uh, as, as they inferred also, it's for students of all levels. Whether you're a beginner, you're going to get a head start in understanding the tradition, the history of herbalism. Intermediate and advanced is only going to enhance your understanding. And like Francis implied too, it's, it's a long time study. And so you can read more about the details of what will be included here. Uh, the dates for the classes are here as well. June 30th is the first one. Wednesday, July 28th is the second class. And if you can't make it, no problem. We are going to be having a live online webinar, but if you can't make it, the recordings will be available and you can enjoy those at your leisure. Currently, uh, so this includes a 37 page amazing, now 37 pages because Wow. Francis, Francis's original text was like okay. 10, 10 font or something. <laughs> so oh, I bumped wow. it up to 16, just so it's easier for everybody's okay. eyes. So that did make it a whopping 37 page document. Uh, so um, still super helpful. I read through it. I'm like, oh, that's what that means. <laughs> super, and, but we still have to learn how to pronounce these. This is what we were talking about before this, this class um, preview class here is how do you pronounce that? So maybe we'll learn some of that as well <laughs> or, or how we differ or how they differ, uh, Matt and Francis and the pronunciation. Uh, with this option, you'll also have one year access to the recordings and materials and Matt and Francis will be available for Q&A, not only during the live online class, but also afterwards. There's a function on the site where you can ask questions, even once the class is over and, the, and you're watching the class recording. As I mentioned, there's an early bird special, and from now until the first class, so the first class is on June 30th, you can save $20.00. And it's $55. The, the discount is already applied. You don't have to worry about any coupon code or anything like that. Uh, for $55 for both classes and the handout. Pretty amazing. It's a pretty great deal. This will go up to $75 um, af after the first class on the 30th. And also something to note, enrollment will end on July 22nd, which is the second class. We're closing it off. Um, even if we get um, a big class too, we may have to cut it off early so that we have a nice quaint classroom. Um, so those are some dates to make note of. Um, you can review the content and the class dates here. Um, and again, the early bird special saved $20 from now until the first class starts. That's on June 30th, 7 p.m. US Central. There's a handy time converter zone tool up here. And so definitely take advantage of, of the discount. Uh, and um, it's a terrific deal. So uh, let's see, what else? I was gonna show you real quick too, the, the handout is really substantial, is really amazing. Um, and this will give you a quick tour also of how to find this. So. 
All our new classes are always from the homepage. You can find them in the new live online classes. This is the class that's going to be right after um, this preview promo. But here you go. It's here. But you may be seeing this when it's no longer in the new classes. So you can always search in all courses up here and you can search herbs, you can search class names, uh, all kinds of stuff, but we're gonna search Culpepper and that will bring up this course, which we're talking about, uh, which will start in a couple weeks here. So that's how you would find that at any point and then once I've purchased the course, I can go to my dashboard. I'm in my account because I see my account info here. I go to my dashboard and then I start the course. And what I wanted to show you is the handout is really terrific. And this is downloadable. And so you'll learn, and I made the font nice and readable too. So when you print it out, it, you can easily take notes, easily read it. But, okay, we're seeing, I'm going through all the common, <laughs> common words here. Okay, we decided this is og, pronounced ogs. I don't, we'll find out. What are ogs? Alternating fever and shivering fits recurring at regular intervals. Thank you so much, Francis. Now I actually <laughs> know what that means. Um, it's super helpful. So there's common words too, but like cachexia, how are we pronouncing that? Cachexia is our best guest. Yes. Maybe we'll have a vote. That's, that's <laughs> still used in medicine. So that is Cachexia is correct. I've heard that. Yeah. yeah it is still used. Yeah. 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 And so this is an amazing handout with definitions and also the remedies. As Francis mentioned that he, this has been a, 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 a research in, in progress. So that's definitely something to get started with because download this and check this out before class, try some of the remedies out, um, obviously that apply with, with good guidance and uh, you'll have great questions and be ready for class that starts on the 30th. And that too has the option for discussion and ask questions later as well. So Ciao for now. Adios. I do. I had all kinds of words coming to my mind. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for joining us. If you are interested in learning more, you can visit our website at matthewwoodinstituteofherbalism.com. You can find all of our social links in the description below. Also, please subscribe to our channel so you can keep up with the latest videos.